Good morning from the Western Thieves. We're going to see the most picturesque ancient site on this side of the river, the astonishing and famous temple of the female pharaoh, Hatshepsut, in Der El Bahri. Let's go! The Western Thebes was the most significant part of the capital city for religious Egyptians. The temple complex of Der El Bahri is situated in the heart of the Theban necropolis, so we're about to see the center of the center. I come back to this temple almost every year and what really amazes me is that the further or higher you go, the more interesting it becomes. See for yourself! The pyramid shaped like hill El Kerna is overlooking the temple of Hatshepsut, situated in the imposing landscape. Just right behind these majestic cliffs, the Valley of the Kings is located. The temple itself was raised on the sacred land of Hathor, mistress of the west, almost exactly across from the temple of Amun in Karnak. It's one of the greatest Egyptian architectural achievements. Perfectly horizontal colonnaded structure contrasts with the rough cliffs of the valley. Since antiquity the place has attracted thousands of tourists and as you can see nothing has changed. During the New Kingdom the site featured three mortuary temples. The oldest one, located to the left of the Hatshepsut temple, was built more than 4,000 years ago during the Middle Kingdom by Mentuhotep II during the 11th dynasty. And this, by the way, was the very first mortuary temple ever built in Thebes. Designed probably by Senenmut during the early years of Hatshepsut's reign, the temple was to captivate by its enormous scale, measuring almost 275 meters in length, over 100 meters in width, and according to different sources, 25 to 30 meters in height. Though much bigger, the temple of Hatshepsut, especially its style, is very similar to the neighboring 500 years older temple of Mentuhotep. But what it's all about, and who was Hatshepsut? I wanted to show you the lowest level in more details, but unfortunately, there are ongoing restorations or excavation works. The first, lower terrace, measures 120 by 75 meters and once featured, apart from basins and trees, two rows of sphinxes. Hatshepsut, whose name means foremost of noble ladies, lived 49 years, most probably between 1507 and 1458 BCE. Hatshepsut's great-grandfather, Ahmos I, expelled Hyksos from Egypt and founded the 18th dynasty. Her father, Tutmos I, expanded the country on a scale never seen before, so she was born during the prosperous and glorious times for Egypt. Hatshepsut, as a daughter of Thutmose I and his main wife, Queen Ahmos, married her half-brother, 
Tutmos II. However, her husband didn't resemble his great predecessors, absent on the battlefields, Hawk in the nest. Hence, there's a theory claiming that already during his lifetime it was Hatshepsut who pulled the strings. She was already burying her mother's title, God's wife of Amun, which not only meant that she held highly respected position of the highest priestess of Amun, but was also economically independent, as along with the title she acquired land and income. From early on, she started to underline her pure bloodline and divine connotations included in her titles, King's Daughter and King's Sister. She strongly believed that she was the originally intended heir of her father. She must have been determined as she became a regent for not her biological son, which hadn't happened ever before. She reached her goal. After her husband's death, she was a regent for six years, and though the official heir to the throne, Thutmose III, was almost mature enough to take the steer at the time, she declared herself pharaoh and ruled for the next 15 years until her death, even though she was technically a co-ruler with Thutmose III, who was pushed into the background. The middle terrace, 75 by 90 meters, features two shrines. We're in the one dedicated to Anubis, located to the colonnade's right side. Walking through the colonnade towards the ramp, we can admire Hatshepsut presented as a pharaoh, male pharaoh. If Hatshepsut had depicted herself as a female, it wouldn't only have been iconoclastic, but also her rank would have been completely incomprehensible for her subjects, common Egyptians. Here she is wearing a crown of double Egypt, pshent, and a postish, false beard. Nevertheless, Hatshepsut didn't pretend to be a man. It was purely symbolic as she was using titles underlining her femininity, like Daughter of a Moon or Female Falcon. These beautifully reconstructed statues adorn the entrance to the second ramp. The colonnade to the left of the ramp displays famous reliefs showing one of the most renowned achievements of Hatshepsut. She sent an expedition to the land of Punt, which became a major trade partner for Egypt. The trade campaign was commissioned in 1493 BCE. Punt was a distant and mythical land believed at the time to be blessed by the gods, the ancestral home of ancient Egyptians. Hence, it's another name, ta Neja, the land of the gods. It was most likely located somewhere between today's Eritrea and Somalia.
Fat Shepsut sent five 21 meters long ships with 210 men. The journey took about 25 days. First, they sailed down the Nile. In order to reach the Red Sea, they had to disassemble the ships and carry them across the land. Next, they reassembled them and traveled down the Red Sea. But because of the ship's low weight, the crew had to keep close to the shores. It's estimated they covered 50 kilometers daily. Although the first monarch to trade with Punt was already the famous pharaoh Khufu, the expeditions of Hatshepsut were perceived as significant, because they had either re-established their relationship between the two lands, or, as others have suggested, were of an enormous scale, bringing a vast wealth into Egypt. Please take a look at the soldiers with boomerangs and beautiful leopards. Among the goods from Punt were gold, ivory, ebony, wild animals and their skins. The most unique item, however, was live myrrh tree. 31 seedlings were planted on the temple premises and thrived. It was the first successful attempt in history at transplanting exotic trees. The shrine dedicated to the goddess Hathor is located in the far right part of the middle terrace. Originally a separate ramp led to it from the lower terrace, but after rebuilding it became accessible directly from the middle terrace. The shrine is one of the largest and most important complexes in the temple. The main sanctuary is preceded by a bark hall, a vestibule with side niches and two hypostyle halls. The Hathor shrine seems to be neighboring Mentuhotep's temple. There was, however, one more religious structure raised by Hatshepsut's successor, Thutmos III. The temple was squeezed between the two already standing structures. Unfortunately, it was destroyed by the landslide in about the 11th century BCE, so only a few centuries after its construction, and whatever remained of it was taken and reused in other buildings. The existence of the Temple of Thutmose III was lost in oblivion until 1961, when a Polish archaeologist Kazimierz Michałowski discovered it. Actually, the Temple of Hatshepsut was restored by the Polish archaeological team led by Michałowski, and until today 
calls conduct works on the site. The second ramp leads to the third terrace. Going there, we're passing by the horizontal colonnade, featuring exquisite Osirian statues, showing the characteristic physiognomy of the female pharaoh. Jesser Jesseru Holy of Holies, a wonderful temple of Hatshepsut was most likely designed by her famous architect Senenmut. He came from a poor family from Lower Nubia. We can say for sure how this simple soldier found himself on the king's court and how he became a tutor of Hatshepsut and Thutmose the second little daughter. After the pharaoh's death, he acquired a title of the high steward of the king Hatshepsut. He oversaw Hatshepsut's great building projects. We've already seen her obelisk in one of my previous episodes about Karnak, you can find the link below. And soon I'll take you to her quarry in Aswan. Anyway, Hatshepsut's mortuary temple was his masterpiece. He commissioned his own tomb to be located in its vicinity. Of course, there's a popular theory. Senenmut's affair with the female pharaoh. A graffiti, kind of political satire, left by the workers raising the temple is an alleged proof of their relationship. The drawing depicts a couple engaging in sexual intercourse in which the woman is wearing a royal nemes. Another hypothesis, however, states that Senenmut was involved romantically with Hatshepsut's daughter, Neferura, who he'd educated and raised. It's evidenced by the figure of their alleged son, Maiherpere, a boy with Nubian features, brought up on the royal court, close to the royal family, entered in the Valley of the Kings. What's the truth about Senenmut? Most probably, we'll never know. The portico courtyard features a few chapels devoted to the cult of Hatshepsut, her father, Thutmos I, and guards. Amun, Anubis, and Rahorahte, whose imposing sun altar we're seeing right now. And it's the biggest monument of its kind. Until the end of the New Kingdom, once a year, a picturesque procession was heading to the temple. In Karnak, in the precinct of Amun, three lavishly adorned sacred barks were prepared for the holy journey. They housed the statues of the Theban triad, Amun Ra with his family, wife Mut and son Honsu. Carried to the boat by the priests, after crossing the river, the sacred triad visited mortuary temples of the pharaohs to renew and fortify the connection between the West, land of the dead, land of the setting sun, with the East, land of the living, land of the rising sun. The shrine of the triad's head, Emun Ra, was carried to the Jesser Jesseru. It symbolized the bond between the king of the gods and the king of the people. The whole event was known as the beautiful feast of the valley, as among offerings the most popular were flowers, considered to have been the best kayas of the holy presence. 
Thus, after the ceremonies, the participants of the festivities took them to their relatives' tombs in order to reassure the renewal of their spirits. We're now seeing the chapel for the sacred bark of Amun, where the festival procession ended. Being a pharaoh in the 15th century BCE, a godlike figure, and the actual owner of the most powerful empire in the world and its inhabitants, we can definitely call Hatshepsut, if not the most powerful, then one of the most powerful women in history. But who would have thought that such an influential woman would, quote, moisturize herself to death? According to German archaeologists, a lotion which Hatshepsut was using was most probable the immediate cause of her death in 1458 BCE, a bone cancer. She also suffered from diabetes, arthritis and bad teeth. After standing in the shadows for years, Hatshepsut's successor, Thutmose III, put a great effort into erasing the female pharaoh from the pages of history. As I already mentioned in my previous episodes, the name and its utterance by the posterity was crucial for ancient Egyptians in terms of their sustenance in the afterlife. Thutmose III, as an act of revenge, defaced Hatshepsut's reliefs and chiseled off her cartouches, replaced them by his own, his father's Thutmose II or grandfather's Thutmose I, as if the continuity of Thutmose's succession has never been interrupted. Obviously, he commissioned her statues to be destroyed, especially nose and eyes, so she couldn't breathe or see in the afterlife. Hatshepsut's great building projects, however, kept her memory alive. Thutmose III failed, but luckily for Egypt, it was his only defeat. He turned out to be one of the greatest pharaohs, military genius, the Napoleon of Egypt. Thank you for watching! To stay tuned, please tap the subscribe button and help my channel grow by commenting, liking and sharing my content with your friends. If you enjoyed this video, you might also enjoy my previous episodes from Egypt and I link down below my playlists from Greece and Turkey. And see you on another ancient site!